everybody. It is Mike Levin on Friday, October 1st, 2021. On my way to pick up my kid, I'll be watching a bit of her soccer game tonight. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to leave early enough to see the whole game. I'll be lucky if I catch the tail bit. That's because I had work coming up. You know, Friday's a work day, I make myself available. And a fair amount of our projects are sprung upon us, so we go into, you know, full production, full, you know, uh, bearing down on the work mode and just getting it done. So I'm just coming out on the other end of one of those um, stretches, and it feels good. You exercise yourself, you work your craft. And boy, is my craft taking a big step forward. I am really loving concurrency now, which is a, a deep, deep surprise, given that there are patterns in programming that I back off of because they violate the 80-20 rule. The 80-20 rule just asks you to start to plan your tasks, so when you're only one-fifth done, you could have stopped and still have won. So I've backed off of many a tech endeavor in the past because what I saw when standing at the edge of the precipice outside the rabbit hole, looking down into the rabbit hole, I saw great unknown depth and I backed off from the private static void. And Java is one of the programming languages that has defeated me over the years. It defeated me because uh, what I saw when I tried the hello world examples scared me off. And the same can be said for C++, which I think is a bit of a shame because the ANSI standard C programming language, which is some 30 or 40 commands, is really quite easy to learn. You can learn the, you know, gist of it, the fundamentals of the whole C programming language in one sit-down session, reading through each of the functions, going, oh, that's what it does, and this is how scope works, and how include file works, and linking, and... This is how you compile. And then you can take that ball and run with it, except of course that running it with it is the whole building of your own private libraries for every thing that you have to do again. You reach into your library of ways that you've solved it before. And what Python is, is it's like, you know, the wisdom of the crowd, free and open source version of those common C libraries for all people with wonderfully worked out and hammered out APIs and then with it actually being C optimized where appropriate. So Python is very much like the C programming language with a framework. Python being the framework to the C programming language. And the two get along so well it's driven a lot of Python's popularity. It's been one of its great boons and one of its great Achilles heels because it lets it do, you know, stupid compiled C optimization code tricks like NumPy, the matrix array processor, the rocket science, the Fortran that's not quite built into the Python standard library, but it's easy enough to pip install these days because the wheel system and pre-compiled binary. So stories evolve, things people have taken for granted for years, if not decades, can suddenly, you know, be turned upside down in a few weeks as python.org decides to adopt a new uh, standard way of pushing out optional binaries for, for packages. And all the work that Anaconda does to get the miraculous install of all those components done is greatly not needed anymore because of the wheel system and pip install and the Python packaging index. So I think I'm going off on a tangent there and freshening up my SEO tools. I've had a recent round of work to do of the standard sort. It's always, you know, here's something you need to, uh, some sort of data you need to pull, either from a application program interface API using formal connections to data sources 
or through a website crawl where you go out much the way Google does, you hit a page, you pull it down, you hit a page, you pull it down, or uh, a third way that's becoming increasingly popular, the automating of the browser, uh, of the Chrome browser, Chrome or Chromium or Microsoft Edge, you can all automate, uh, you can automate all of them these days through the Puppeteer library for Node.js, so it's like npm install Puppeteer. It's under a very different framework, the framework for Java, the and Microsoft bought it, by the way. In addition to buying GitHub, you know, people tell me this like uh, I wouldn't have heard of it, but yeah, I keep very close tabs on what Microsoft acquires uh, based on, you know, uh, trying to read the tea leaves. And there's a lot of tea leaves to be read concerning Microsoft. Them buying GitHub, them hiring the creator of Python, Guido Van Rossum, them putting Python, a, the, the C standard specification, uh, C Python from Guido in the Microsoft store with the install starting by just opening any Microsoft terminal and typing Python, it starts the Microsoft st store install, which means serious embracing of the Python ways. The VS Code text editor, having the Jupyter Notebook engine, really the IPython engine, incorporated in so you can get the same interactive work sessions, the same REPL, read, eval, print loop environment that lets you kind of delightfully experiment with Python code as you go. So Microsoft incorporated that into their free and open source uh, text editor, which is filling a vacuum, which is created because nothing stays king of the hill. Nothing remains dominant in the text editor category for more than, say, half a decade or so. They each keep knocking each other off the mantle. Um, text programs like Sublime and Note++, they all have their run, and they all stay around as perfectly viable text editors. But who wants to hang their muscle memory and their career on something that only has half-hearted support from its developer and is unlikely to ever be turned over to the free and open source world to start taking, uh, you know, pushing the state of it forward. So the discussion always comes back to the fact that there are two great text editors that have survived the vetting of tech evolution, and they are Emacs and Vim, and VI in all its various incarnations. People ask me, is, you know, NVM and NeoVim all as good as Vim? Yeah, sure, they're as good as Vim as long as the macro recording and playback system works mostly the same way. Because if you switch between systems that has a different macro keyboard recording and playing back system, you've lost like one third of your muscle memory superpowers. You need to be able to record and play back macros and even take those instructions and wrap them into script files so that you can have libraries of macros that you can bind to keystrokes, that you can drop in your .vimrc, that you can uh, keep in GitHub so that you can, you know, uh, git clone your vim configuration onto any machine you sit down on. And what little customizations uh, you decide that you will embrace and live with because it is really worth doing. It's worth, you know, um, having a few Vim keyboard shortcuts and keyboard bindings uh, that you have to manually install with your, you know, putting your VimRC in place, uh, either in your home directory or in the repo you're working with. There's an order in which they take precedence over each other, but your invisible .vimrc is your configuration file for Vim that lets you do some configuration. Now, some people use Vim plugins. Uh, I don't. I find it to be unnecessary. Just a minimally yet creatively configured VimRC gives you things like both the numbers along the left-hand side and relative numbers so you can know to go up by a certain number of characters or down by a certain number of characters at quick visual glance and it all helps contribute to that whole telepathic control of text kind of feeling an effect that you're trying to uh, achieve 
uh, now, today, in your everyday work, and forever forward for the rest of your life in not just work, but personal journaling, writing because you like writing. You know, I'm part of the opposite of the do it uh, once or uh, don't repeat yourself, the drive movement, big in the Ruby on Rails world. DRY, don't repeat yourself. Again, that's DRY, don't repeat yourself. I am a member of the wet group, as opposed to dry, don't repeat yourself. I am wet, we enjoy typing. I like to type. Now, even if you don't repeat yourself, you're achieving that by just making pointers, pointers to pointers to pointers to pointers, levels of normalization that only make it di more difficult to read what you're looking at because everything points to something else and nothing reads like it's ever in context. Now, when you're working in Python in the web browser in Jupyter Notebook, it actually encourages you to not write functions because your REPL behavior, your read eval print loop that lets you, you know, pick up where you left off in the next code block, inspect the contents of variables, change a value, try something with it, change it a little more. You know, an interactive session of running your code instead of running it once was the result what I expected. This is a lot more interactivity, like a musical instrument. You have your fingers on the chords and, you know, you can feel the pulse of your program running. So in that REPL environment, you get to see the last values that was in any variables, but if you're fighting scope, scope which is created from such things as functions and the content managers, that scope, the value of those variables, which are really references, pointers to places in memory, get garbage collected, cleaned up and destroyed, and you can't uh, refer to them. So as soon as you put stuff inside of functions, you lose some of the Jupyter Notebook joy. However, it is not a showstopper. It is just a strong suggestion for a workflow and a type of illumination, a type of aha moment once, uh, once you get it. And it turns out what we're all really endeavoring to do is to push around the complexity so that the place where we have to express ourselves over and over all the time on a day-to-day -day basis, the place where we code the most, has the simplest API for our most common cases. Where we might accommodate a few edge cases, but not at the sacrifice of the beauty of the APIs for our everyday work so that we can be like speed demons 90% of the time, or let's say 80% of the time, because there's that 80-20 rule again. It's an average distribution thing. You're trying to drop what you have to do all the time and what you have to do most of the time to coordinate those two so that you do less typing. And the commands are more obvious and less in volume, so you're looking at less code and what it does is clearer to you. So to that end, you take things that you do put into functions, because I'm not telling you to stay away from func functions with Jupyter Notebook. I'm just saying don't have a lot of functions in, in your notebook because you're moving them off into imported libraries, into imported packages. And you can make your own package for importing as another file just sitting there in the same directory. In fact, that's the easiest way to do it. You want a configuration file that works like a global container for values that get reused by other packages that may import them or even be aware of that other package's existence. I'm talking about, you know, global config files that the packages you import know about uh, because package A can import package B and package B can import package A and you control your code entry points so that nothing runs by accident. That's why that, you know, if name equals, you know, quote, double, underscore, main, double, underscore, all lowercase. You know, if, if name equals main is a trick that you'll see all the time in Python because it controls the entry point. It is a safeguard in case that whole script is loaded as a package so that it's subcomponents, it's 
functions and classes, methods and properties can be, become ex available to anything that wishes to import it and use its resources without risking running it as if it were, you know, <clears throat> a request to, to run it, as if importing it was a request to run it to do its thing. So it takes a while to really get, to really grok and appreciate the Python import landscape scenarios, how it works. But once, once you do in it, understand it, it's just a sheer delight. And you get the idea that whenever you have, you know, code that you don't want to look at anymore, but it always has to be there, you just push it off into one of those libraries that you import with an import statement. So if you have, you know, file foo.py next to main.py and you're editing main.py, you can say import foo. And there it is. Everything inside of foo is now available as foo.this, foo.that inside your main program. And so, yeah, object-oriented isn't so bad. There are parts of object-oriented that I really like. The way it handles namespaces on imports, mwah, very sweet. And the way scope is handled, similarly sweet. Things, you know, local variables don't survive outside package scope. So anything that's inside foo, you know, can't be addressed out by that name outside foo. There's no global variable sharing. I mean, there can be, but you'd have to really go out of your way to make it happen. And it's silly when, you know, you don't need globals because you just reach into that package name, foo dot whatever, and you can get those, var those variables. They're as good as global. So object-oriented techniques give you as good as global uh, when you need them. So I embrace it for that. Now, speaking of, <coughs> excuse me, speaking of embracing things that I was hesitant to embrace in the past, enter concurrency, okay? The async await keywords and how it works in Python previously was a source of grief and pain, and I really objected to it. I, I objected to having to use the async and await magically sprinkled into my scripts to get the kind of performance and behavior that I wanted slash needed to get that everyone else was getting. So FOMO, fear of missing out, once the async IO library was in Python, and certain things that you would wait 10 minutes for could suddenly take 30 seconds, I'll take the 30 seconds. I'm not gonna take the uh, the waiting the for sequential access uh, the way I used to. Uh, in fact, there's lots of interesting stub stories about there, about burning IPs on SERP and living with burning IPs because they're getting the next IP and making all the requests concurrently, which you know, potentially could get you above your 81 rows before the CAPTCHA. Oh, so many interesting stub sub stories, but maybe we'll talk about that later. However, the new tool in my Swiss Army knife of SEO is making concurrent requests of a list of provided URLs. So here's a list of URLs that you can get all different ways. You know, visit a web Wikipedia page and grab the a link list off of one of those pages and you have a list of URLs. And then you want to fetch, you want to crawl the HTML, but it's really more than the HTML. It's downloading everything about the um, the web page request, except maybe the, the pictures and the JavaScript and the other resources, but everything that's in view source and the response headers, which is some invisible stuff that you're not really exposed to a lot in your web browser, but which has some important stuff in it, like the uh, title tag, um, oh, and, and the headers uh, that carries like what the page you asked for was, what the response headers were. So when you are when you give a list of URLs, you don't just want the HTML, the view source of the response page, you want the whole response object, which includes all that HTML, but a bunch of other goodies too. And that is the raw request. So. You send page requests, you get back response. 
you want to be able to store that response somewhere so you can get it again later to do you know whatever ails you scratch whatever itch uh, you have so it might be canonical tag extraction or analyzing redirect chains or all the different things that people like me do to help websites get more traffic or not lose the traffic that they once had during a migration. Uh, there's just a whole bunch of reasons uh, to crawl, to pull down all the contents of a list of URLs. Now that is a perfect task for parallelizing. It is what we call a parallelizable or a map reducible task because if you had a dedicated machine for fetching a URL and you had as many of those separate physical machines as you have URLs and you had, you know, a hundred URLs and a hundred of those machines, how many cycles, how many clock cycles would it take you to fetch all hundred URLs? One clock cycle, because it breaks it into a hundred pipelines, sends the request out over a hundred pipelines, gets the request back simultaneously from all of them at once, and then it marshals or gathers the results and um, makes them available to you as if it had gone through a sequential process to gather the data. It just now effectively has happened in one one hundredth of the time it took before. So that's a kind of concurrency mikey likey. I can wrap my mind around it because it's always list based. Things are not parallelizable, they are not map reducible unless they exist in a sequence where each sequence has its own separate discrete piece of work that doesn't have dependencies like before or after dependencies on the other elements in that list. So hence it lends itself to concurrency really well. You'll see list comprehensions used where concurrency is being used a lot. But it doesn't have to be. You can still use normal loops, but those loops tend to be with a with. The loops tend to be with, 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 with. Because with is an indicator that you have the context manager, and context managers do a whole bunch of uh, data iterating, uh, internal stuff for performance, for being kind on memory, and etc. that um, da, da, da. that the normal open itself, oh, well, that open, yeah, open without the with doesn't do, right? So with brings the context manager to open, and with brings the context manager to other packages that support the context management API, which are a lot of them. One of them happens to be the SQLite dict package. I think it's pip install, install SQLite dict. I think it should be standard library. I don't know how I could live without it now that I've used it a few times. I'm a big customer of Python pickles and shells. The uh, data persistence model that pickles and shells, you know, propose is a good one. I like it a lot. You can build all kinds of uh, data caches, local database things uh, out of it. However, the performance is terrible, terrible, terrible. So if you were to fetch the, you know, HTML of 100 URLs and have to put it somewhere, if you put it in a shelf full of pickles, you could pull it out again later, but you wouldn't want to wait for, for it to do so. So pip install yourself some SQLite dict which allows the SQLite highly optimized compiled C bit. It's a lot like the regular expression engine and regular expression engine and other bits of things here and there that are best practices that have been out there in the tech world forever that get compiled in to make them available. XML parsers are often in that category. Um, but here we have um, SQLite that's sitting there waiting to do this kind of work for you with all the, you know, primary key data integrity stuff uh, and optimized performance that comes with, you know, database methodology and code that's been hammered on for a long time and free to open source. 
So it's nice to use the SQLite that comes with the Python standard library, but it's not nice to use raw SQL or even SQL Alchemy or even the lightweight worms, object relational mapping packages, because now you're getting, you're coding your knowledge and know-how to a particular ORM, a package, a, a dependency, and the closer you stick to the standard Python dictionary API for key value type things, the easier it will be to rewire the back end from, you know, whatever A uh, to whatever B. And so that's how SQLite dict works. I believe I abbreviate it to just uh, SQL dict. So I, you know, from SQLite dict, all lowercase, import SQLite dict up a camel case, but then I go as SQL dict, all lowercase. Now I have something I can use amazingly with a context manager. So where normally it's with open, you can do with SQL dict. And then you can refer to a database name. If it's not there already, it creates it. You can, you know, you decide what to use as keys. And if you're making a fetch of HTML pages, what else would you use for keys other than the URL, a unique resource locator? That U uh, in URL makes for really perfect primary keys in database systems. So you put the whole response code of the request as the data. So you would have something like for SQL dict, you know, crawl.db as db. And then for each web page you fetch, you would say db and use a key. So the square bracket notation you'd use the URL is the inside the square bracket and you would say equals response, whatever you got back from the uh, HTTP request is your response object. I'm using the HTTPX package these days, but so many people use requests. You would store the whole requests response object as the data so you can get everything back from the view source text of the page, the HTML, if, it, if you will to, you know, what URL was made, made the request again. It's stored in there. You don't even have to store it separately. Uh, if there was a redirect and what the redirect chain was, it's all in there. It's really amazing. And you can crawl a site in, you know, 60 megabytes, 100 megabytes, you know, even a few gigabytes. You can do it in a very memory efficient way. And this is the part that really blows my mind, okay? I'm gonna try and wrap this up quickly and I'll show it to you, but I have to really internalize it. This is the muscle memory I need to create. This is the game changing Python stuff. So when you program something that can work asynchronously, when you create an asynchronous function, if you call it without the await keyword before it, you get a coroutine, which is a lot like a promise. They used to use the word promise. Uh, a promise gets returned. It says, the work has not necessarily been done yet. In fact, it hasn't been done yet unless, until you say start. But when it is done, here's where you'll find it. It's pointers to where to look. And so as soon as you invoke it again with the await keyword, it will trigger off all those concurrent map reducible tasks in the background and optionally gather the response and pass them back up as if it were carried out as a sequential loop. So to do that, you use the context manager. Um, well, let's see, that's not necessarily true. To do that, you use a asynchronous function. And then when you want to call it, you just throw the await keyword in front of it. But if you open a database connection using the context manager to, to a SQL light dict, so with SQL dict open database as, and instead of FH that I would normally do there for file handle, I use DB for database uh, colon. Now you can say for each item in that promise that just returned, but you use the await keyword there, immediately under the context manager, immediately under a with statement, an open command from the context manager. If you do that, then the asynchronous magic happens at the moment that you're iterating to do a database 
update, row by row update routine. So these rows are updating in the background as if concurrent. However, SQLite isn't really, you know, concurrent like that. So it's doing its own thing in the background to make sure it gets just plastered through. And it's not gonna be your bottleneck. It can get plastered through sequentially in the background. It's this optimized C stuff doing it because by the time, you know, a row hits it, it's caught up with the last insert or whatever action you asked it to do. So what I'm saying is that if you create an asynchronous Python function, you can use it with the context manager under a database uh, connection, which means that you can crawl a site with one command get back a promise, it takes no time because it's a promise. You say, crawl site, here's a crawl promise. I'll take that variable named crawl and I'll say, you know, with SQL dict crawl data as db, then it would be for page in crawl db with a key URL equals await oh, I have to it's hard to do the coding on uh, <laughs> talking it through here but the await keyword goes in on that uh, for each statement and then with SQL like dict in the context manager you have to do a db.commit and if you do it indented at that same point it's going to be a row by row commit so no data is lost so if you're doing some big concurrent job and you want whatever rows you can be preserved while the bad rows sort of just fall through the cracks, this is a valid way to do it. So if you're working against some sort of website that has a denial of service attack that's gonna kick in after a hundred page requests from the same IP and you're requesting a thousand pages, the this concurrent page fetching routine will get those first hundred pages of 900 errors because it's still going to try and fetch those individual ones in the background you can have a whole concurrent task fail on any single element failing i tend to turn that off because you don't want a single page load on a crawl to stop the whole crawl unless you immediately restart and so there's a real tree shaking algorithm here. Um, in fact, I've called my first go at this a tree shaker. And um, in this way, you can have backing off routines and a combination of this sort of concurrent fetching and back off routines. And if you have IP cycling built in at this level, you can get all the data you need uh, in a as short of a time frame as possible. And I'm really enjoying this way of coding now. I never thought I would. I always knew that map reducible processes were, you know, parallelizable more simply in, in theory, but I have not encountered it in practice because I have not had the correct API or package to hit, to hit against. The, to make it natural, to make it for humans. So, with a little bit of list comprehension and a weight moving around magic, that package is HTTPX. HTTPX is doing it for me. It keeps the requests API, it gives it high performance concurrency, and it suggests patterns to use, list comprehension heavy patterns to use, that work really well with the concurrency. And, and probably that's where um, I'll wrap up because uh, it's such a difficult concept. I'm trying to get the muscle memory there to perform it over and over, to do it over and over, and you know, to do some fairly complex SEO, you know, stupid web tricks, stupid SEO, stupid data scientist tricks just with that spontaneous mastery, you know, crawl a site, crawl at X levels deep, okay, fine, extract the meta tags, okay, do these, you know, longest sequence and common comparisons between fields like the description and the body copy to see what 
keywords a page seems to be targeting, run the SERPs for those keywords, find whether it's positioning there, and basically close all those loops and connect all those dots that, and scratch all those itches that SEOs and data scientists and all these people who have to gather and process and analyze data would like to be able to do uh, with the best Kung Fu, the most natural, so that you're doing it with that same, you know, ease that, um, you know, you, you do like Vim coding. In fact, you know, getting really good in Jupyter Notebook is starting to become a lot like getting really good in Vim. It has that secret, same secret weapon feeling. And that reminds me, I do probably want to incorporate as one of my next things, uh, Zero Message Q, ZMQ. Uh, it's got one of the most awesome logos I've ever seen for free and open source uh, software. Uh, but it, it's the thing that's responsible for uh, Jupiter's so snappy behavior passing messages around in real time between its components without having a complex message queue. It's an 80-20 solution to uh, you know inter-component messaging, uh, inter-process communication uh, between your systems, whether it's Python or anything else. It's one of these things that's being ported to everything. So I really want and need to cut my teeth on uh, zero message queue at some part during this uh, stuff, but I have a whole bunch of new SEO kata that I'll walk through a bunch of it with you and uh, you know, hopefully uh, freshen up the, the Pipulate. It's probably gonna be the Pipulate package. I've got a few other ideas uh, for how to do this, but um, you know, the, the form, the good proper form that you go through to do all the uh, standard exercises one needs to do in the field so that the complex, the actual complex stuff is uh, comes down one more notch towards easy. We shove the complexity around, so I'm about to shove the complexity of standard SEO functions into the Pipulate library so that you can Pipulate sites to produce all kinds of deliverables. How do you do that? Well, I just Pipulated it. And Jupyter Notebook is a lot of the powerful magic now that's being sprinkled in. Um, yeah, Python and uh, Jupyter Notebooks and Pandas and uh, NB Dev, NB Dev more and more so these things can become packages and automated scheduled uh, things in turn. Closing that whole feedback loop and maybe one day I'll throw us some of them into uh, web services, microservices, uh, an actual website and have all the components then uh, being served up through uh, this, uh, this, this approach, this technique. Uh, Linux, Python, Vim, and Git, um, lowest common denominator, and best hits against uh, problems that come up in a variety of domains with uh, the least changing tools over time so that your muscle memory can work for you the most so that you push the complex right into these packages that you can inspect and have 100% control over, but you don't have to look at, at all the time. And what's left in that outside scope, the main program, such as it were, is uh, just enough for perfect, perfect clarity, uh, ongoing maintenance, ongoing um, you know, revisions, uh, permutations, and really never uh, getting hung up on uh, large, difficult to understand code bases, uh, dependencies disappearing on you, uh, APIs changing on you, uh, vendors raising prices on you, just the kind of general freedom one would expect by having. Uh, always available, uh, local, SQL, um, and uh, always available 24 by seven scheduling, always available powerful work session environment for ad hoc, uh, you know, in front of the client work and um, answering new questions. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's what I'm getting at here. Um, never, 
turn your nose at anything uh, as much as I'm trying to stay away from a web development, which is programming a genie. Poof, what do you need? And web servers take in all kinds of variations from users, so you, you have to write, write something that responds to a large number of case study uh, of cases, a lot of edge case handling, because you don't know what kind of input or requests are going to come in. And so a lot of work then goes into the user interface because it's web-based and humans are interacting with it through a web user interface. So simple projects become a hundred times more difficult as soon as there's a user interface for it because humans. And, uh, you know, they become a uh, hundred times more difficult or complex when it's a, a web interface in the first place because variety of you know, unanticipated input and user behavior. Things become a hundred times more deterministic, easy to interact with, when you control the input every time. When, you know, reports aren't generated but for the reports you request to be re re uh, created. And then the, um, you know, it becomes more deterministic still when those requests are made according to some scheduler that you um, control. You can do software profiling, you can see how long things take to run, and then you can space out the scheduling accordingly. And then you can watch for edge cases of long runs because of data conditions, and holidays, more data spiking the system, and, and you know, create either build in the uh, uh, the, the flex of the room, the buffer room between scheduled events, or use algorithms or concurrency or any number of other techniques to make sure that all your jobs continue to run given the same resources. And then if you really want, you can use scheduling systems that when a job fails on machine A is carried out on machine B. So, you know, I tend to not do that, but it is available to me. It's not one of my fortes. I tend to make the exact resource that I'm using for scheduling, you know, uh, efficiently and safely running with margin in a deterministic and finite way. And that generally means it's not a web server. Um, so that's the stuff I'll be bringing you to real soon now. And uh, I really got to wrap up here. Thanks for joining me. Hope to see you again soon. And don't forget to subscribe.